the infinite depths of darkness can be sliced open by light. And for the finite expanses of the miracle called life, it has but one delicate vessel. Earth. It has been here a long time. The light has gently bathed this beautiful complex membrane faithfully. Mankind is the only form of life to step back and take a long, hard look at our only home. Our intelligence has brought us here, and it has also brought us much closer to another world within us. And within this universe, ironically, lies the blueprint for our future, cancer. It is a biocode gone wrong. It is delighted by what we do to feed it. The menu we've provided for these creatures is becoming more extensive by the day, except that one human being found a way to close the pantry doors a long time ago, in 1928. This is that story. The famous naturalist John Muir once wrote, if one pulls on a single thread in nature, you'll find it attached to everything else. For this 15-year-old boy named Garrett, he rediscovers that fact from different angles regularly. He lives with his father in a remote section of Alaska, where traveling in bush planes is almost routine. From these vantage points, the health of forests, wildlife, and even glacier melt can be easily observed. For Garrett, his sensitivities about nature are acute. His eyes have already seen nature in the raw, with many obvious questions answered before he had time to actually read about it in a book. As far back as he can remember, his family has worked with orphaned wildlife and so his understanding of biology was hands-on there too. Thanks in part to a special book written by a Dr. Max Gerson. He understood how important it is to feed a young creature such as this porcupine the right mix of foods, or that creature would succumb quickly, especially in its first few days of life. Regular visits to our neighbor Bob provided this unpasteurized goat's milk. No store could legally supply this. Bob's wife, Margaret, is recovering from breast cancer. But she recently heard from Garrett about Dr. Gerson. And then word spread in the community about this Gerson therapy. People that were deeply impacted positively included the mayor, the local electrician, the banker, the hammer museum guy, then there was the beekeeper, who saw links to the Gerson therapy that extended even to the health and productivity of his bees. There was also the artist, the people at the organic store, and then a Gerson tape was obtained. There are laws against healing cancer. The doctor is not allowed to try anything else. He must use only those treatments that have already proven to be failures. Imagine what we could do if this could be accepted. But there are laws against it. You're not allowed to heal. There's too much money to be made on drugs. For Garrett's diabetic neighbor John, this message came too late to save his legs. But perhaps Bob, the milkman, had the best observation about the Gerson therapy. What I'd like to see is some proof, some good scientific proof. When a cruise ship came to town, many visitors would come to learn about the wildlife that Garrett cared for. He found it surprising how unfamiliar most people were about wild animals and their requirements. The news of this situation eventually got back to Dr. Gerson's daughter, Charlotte, who sent Garrett a little gift. It 
It was a new book written by Charlotte that spelled out how Dr. Gerson's therapy worked. It had easy to understand statements about cancer. Even a 15 year old could find the text a good read. The chapters were profound and seemed too good to be true. Points were made that sparked curiosity to learn more. This moment was about to become a new chapter in Garrett's life. Up to this time, reading a book cover to cover was a rarity for him. But in this instance, it was different, due partly in what the book addressed. It was what he observed day to day even when doing the most mundane chores. What Garrett had not fully realized was the implications of the potency and power contained in vegetation. What seemed like a simple snack taken for granted in the garden had tremendous implications worldwide. If Gerson's therapy was accepted and implemented, it would help change the history of mankind's modern agriculture, food supply, health care systems, economy, and of course, the environment. Then Garrett learned a lesson in being misunderstood one day when his father cleaned the house and tossed an artwork piece Garrett had made into the trash. Because of its unusual design, the community garbage collector fished it out and gave it to local police who declared it a bomb. Definitely a blow to Garrett's creativity. Other situations then took their toll on the boy, and Garrett's straight-A record sunk. His father decided he needed to be homeschooled. His first homeschool lesson was about Dr. Gerson and... I'd like to see some scientific proof. The boy wasn't sure how that would be accomplished, but he did draw out an analogy between gold mining and human nature to start with. He decided the best place to start his research would be the public library. It didn't take much time before he located several independent sources that confirmed important points as outlined in Dr. Gerson's original classic book. From those important leads, the dubious characters that make up the history of the use of fluoride fascinated the boy. He dug for more information, and then more skeletons were uncovered. Then, Garrett began to assemble a general outline of what needed to be accomplished to successfully confirm the Gerson Protocol. It was when the words about hope were written that I made an inquiry to become involved in helping him document the integrity of the Gerson therapy. First, there's Gerald Cox, who worked for the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research. The Mellon Institute, by the way, was the leading defender for the asbestos industry. Gerald Cox became interested in the fluoride from the suggestions of Francis Frary, the director of the Aluminum Laboratory of Alcoa. And then came a leading scientist in toxicology, Dr. Harold Hodge. Harold Hodge was the one who oversaw injecting plutonium and uranium in people. Harold Hodge studied the questionable safety of fluoride, but under the combined pressures of the Atomic Commission and aluminum manufacturing, he had to say it was safe. Harold Hodge, along with a group of scientists, helped develop the atom bomb. I am, will represent one mile on your camera. The top part, two miles, we're going to switch to another camera. I'm going to move out of here. Three, two, one, zero. The shock wave will arrive in the control point area in approximately half a minute. And then came Edward Bernays, the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the wizard of public relations. Selling fluoride for public water supplies was easy for Bernays. He used the slogan, trust your doctor. To this day, even fluoride tablets are dispensed to children, thanks in part for the need to use fluoride to build the atom bomb. Parallels can be drawn from this history to another in the making about cell phones? A $28 million grant was given to Dr. George Carlos in the 90s to prove cell phone safety, but instead he found otherwise. He refused to be paid off. Cell phone transmissions are still a concern as to how they affect insects. 
Do they teach this in public schools? But when it comes to dental health, diet, not fluoride, can play a huge role. This became vivid for Garrett as he assisted on minor surgery of his tame wolf. The perfect cavity-free teeth of the wolf pointed to facts in a book he had just finished studying from the library. It was called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by a distinguished dentist named Dr. Weston Price. Dr. Price traveled the world with his wife in the 1930s to visit native cultures that had never been exposed to modern civilization's diet of white flour, canned food, and sugar. To his amazement, these people averaged less than 1% of tooth decay. And Dr. Price noted something else. None of the people in these different tribes and cultures practiced any sort of dental hygiene. Not one of his subjects had ever used a toothbrush. But once processed food was introduced to them, tooth decay and disease followed, and it was the beginning of the end of the uniformly hardy and strong. Dr. Price studied animals with improper diets. Two-headed calves, deformed cats were the result. He also observed a direct link between human skull formation and diet. And yet, in present day, the subject of fluoride is still debated. In the state capital of Juneau, Alaska, I met up with the city's chief dental officer. For the state of Alaska's position on water fluoridation, the Department of Health and Social Services and Division of Public Health support water fluoridation. But in Alaska, it is a local initiative. And what's going on in Juneau is a local vote on Juneau resuming water fluoridation. So while the department supports this, this is really a, a local issue. And uh, I'm also involved with the Citizens for Dental Health um, coalition, but that's not in my capacity as state dental officer. Do you think that fluoride uh, in the water will help uh, prevent cavities and such? What is your position? I think there's clear evidence so over the past 60 some years now that fluoride reduces tooth decay. But fluoride's only measurable effects on tooth decay are from topical application, not from drinking it. Hitler's alleged reason for mass medicating water with sodium fluoride was to sterilize humans and force them into submission. Garrett needed to see both sides of medicine. He then viewed compelling scenes from stock footage about Gerson I had already compiled. If you think of basically what's uh, in Gerson therapy, you really wouldn't expect it to cure cancer. So no, I don't think there's any evidence that anybody's ever been cured uh, by uh, Gerson therapy. It's, it's, it's not right from any aspect at all. Well, has even, the Gerson therapy ever uh, cured a cancer patient? Well, of course not. They won't even release their records. There's absolutely no scientific evidence that He's cured anyone. You know, I've never interviewed any uh, Gerson patients. It really is pointless. But I had interviewed patients, and more than a couple. These patients had recovered from every type of cancer, and for many of them it was terminal. Orthodox medicine had given up on them and sent them all home to die. Some of them published books about their recoveries. I traveled all over the world, from Holland to Japan, and everywhere it was the same result, recovery. and even heart arteries can be restored. When Prince Charles spoke publicly in favor of the Gerson therapy after observing its effectiveness, he was skewered by the medical community. Nevertheless, I had observed his unwavering sentiments in a letter that was sent to the Gerson Institute. 